Assalamu alaikum, this is Dr. Monet Idrisi, author of the Muslim Narcissist book and empowerment coach for Muslims. In today's podcast, I'll be addressing the issue of faith shaming that happens so much in our Muslim communities. Now, faith shaming is when people are made to believe that they aren't good Muslims, they aren't good enough as Muslims, they are not loved by Allah, and that their tests are all punishments from Allah. Many people are also made to believe that the reason why Allah does not answer their dua is because he favours other people over them and this can cause people to seriously crash in their iman. So I would like to address inshallah all of these issues in this podcast today. I don't know how long this podcast is going to be so bear with me because there is a lot to get through and cover. So as always I'd like to kindly ask you to like the podcast, share and subscribe if it helps you please share it with other people whom you feel could really benefit from this information because I know that this is a serious problem in our ummah. Loads of people are suffering from faith issues because they do not understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his wisdom and they cannot understand how hardships are actually in their favour when they look at it from a perspective in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to teach them something valuable for their life and their akhirah. So I will teach you how to gain a more positive perspective of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this podcast because the majority of issues stem from that. They stem from a very poor understanding of who Allah is and the amount of love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually has for us. So when this perspective is changed and the mindset is changed, we can start looking at the world and our lives and everything that happens in our lives in a more positive way in a way that does not allow us to hate Allah, but rather to see Allah's love and the hidden gems that have been placed by him in every experience we go through in life to bring us closer to him. So the reason why I would like to record this podcast today is because I have been seeing many posts on Instagram and TikTok of preachers, educators, telling people that if they are suffering in their iman, if they are unhappy with their lives, if they are unhappy with their du'as not being answered in the way that they are, then they are not good Muslims. That these are people who have problems with their tawheed, problems with their aqidah, you know, they've got problems with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in general, they, you know, their connection must be bad, there must be something wrong with them to be feeling that way, to be feeling anger and upset and bitterness and resentment towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the response that these people normally get for complaining about Allah or complaining about their difficult life and wondering why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not taken them out of a difficult period of their life the way he has taken other people out of difficult periods of their lives and wondering why Allah gives other people what they have been praying for for a much longer period of time, especially if they are practicing, if you know they pray there five times a day, they go for hajj, umrah, they wear hijab, everything, they stay away from zina, but yet they see people who do all of those things get the things that they have been praying for for a very long time. So when these people who are experiencing these hardships and these spiritual difficulties, when they approach sheikhs or imams or preachers about it, they usually get the response of, you know, there's something wrong with your iman. There's something wrong with your aqidah. You can't say that about Allah. You cannot say that you are upset with Allah. You cannot say that you hate Allah and that you feel like Allah doesn't love you because this is blasphemy. You know, this is Lord of the world. He doesn't owe you anything. He is not here to serve you. You are here to worship him. You are here to praise him. And you cannot argue or complain or show any distress in his divine decree. And they ask them, you know, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are being distressed with Allah's divine decree? Who are you to be upset with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he knows what's best for you? You should have taqwa, you should have tawakkul, you know, that deep trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, you can't be a good Muslim if you have no tawakkul. Or you can't be a believing Muslim if you have no tawakkul. So there's a lot of faith shaming. So when people hear this, they feel ashamed and they feel, well, maybe, yeah, maybe I'm I'm not a good Muslim. Maybe I'm not a believer. Maybe I don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe 
you know, everything that I was taught about religion was wrong. When people are faith shamed in this way, it can cause a massive spiritual crisis that leads them to leave Islam altogether. Because they give up. They give up. They cannot understand why they are given certain hardships when other people are not given them. And a lot of this comes from not having a good Islamic upbringing. Not everyone was given the correct Islamic upbringing while growing up. And you'll often find that those who did, those who did have a good Islamic upbringing, the correct one, where they were taught about Islam properly and they grew up practicing Islam properly and having a good perception of Allah, those people cannot often understand how other Muslims act the way they do or feel about Allah the way they do when they are going through hardships and calamities. They don't understand, so they judge. And honestly, I've never ever come across any community more judgmental than our Muslim ones. Muslims are far too judgmental of each other and they feel like they have the right to faith shame everybody. Everyone who is not doing what they're doing, they feel like they have the right to do so. And I see this in different Muslim communities as well. So the Western Salafis think they're better than the Sufis. Sufis think they're better than other people. And, you know, the way different people practice Islam becomes leverage over other sects or over other groups because they believe that they are practicing Islam in the right way and anyone who doesn't follow their tariqah or follow their way of life or follow their way of practicing Islam is wrong. So they get shamed. I mean, for example, the Western Salafi movement I find it to be far too strict, far too strict. And not everyone can follow that lifestyle. Not everyone can practice Islam in the way that they choose to. And that's why we have so many people leaving Islam after they revert because they are unable to practice Islam in the way a lot of Salafis in the UK demand that it be practiced for you to meet a standard you know, in which you are accepted as a, and known as a full practicing Muslim man or woman. And this is a great problem. This is a great problem because many people can't keep up. Many people feel that there must be something wrong with their iman if they are not dressed a certain way, if they do not act a certain way, or if they do not go to the mosque, you know, X number of times in the week and so on. And so the community becomes very judgmental of that person they start backbiting that person, they start looking down upon that person until that person leaves the community or leaves Islam altogether. And as you all know, my work is about people who appear to be very practicing religious, but they have toxic darkness within them. Okay, you know, again, people say to me, you know, Muslim narcissist, that's a, that's a really bold title for your, for your book and everything. But don't forget, there's a whole chapter about the Muslim narcissist in the Quran, Surah Al-Munafiqun. Surah Al-Munafiqun is about people who claim to be Muslims, but in their hearts, they are something else. In their hearts, they are demonic and toxic. They have no basic manners. They are hypocrites because they do not practice what they preach. They are abusive. They use Islam to abuse others. The entire chapter is about the Muslim narcissist. And so those who get triggered by the title of my book are getting triggered because there's some darkness within them that they can actually relate to when they see the title of my book. There's a whole chapter about these people. So a lot of people who get faith shamed are shamed by people who have darkness inside them. There is a darkness inside them because... In Islam, just because you say you are Muslim does not mean you are a believer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this in the Quran. In Surah Al-Hujarat, Ayah 14, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قالت الأعراب آمنا قل لم تؤمنوا ولكن قولوا أسلمنا ولما يدخل الإيمان في قلوبكم وإن تطيعوا الله ورسوله لا يلتكم من أعمالكم شيئا when the Bedouins say, we have believed, say to them, O Prophet, you have not yet believed. 
but just say instead that you have submitted as Muslims. For faith has not yet entered your hearts. And if you obey Allah and his messenger, he will not deprive you from your deeds of anything in reward. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. So Allah already tells us, that just because someone looks Muslim or says that they are Muslim, it does not mean that they are believers. And again, evidence for this is in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 177. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ قِبْلَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ وَلَكِنَّ الْبِرَّ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَالْمَلَائِكَةِ وَالْكِتَابِ وَالنَّبِيِّينَ وَأَتَى الْمَالَ عَلَى حُبِّهِ ذَوَى الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ وَالسَّائِلِينَ وَفِي الرِّقَابِ وَأَقَامَ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَى الزَّكَاةَ وَالْمُوفُونَ بِعَهْدِهِمْ إِذَا عَاهَدُوا وَالصَّابِرِينَ فِي الْبَأْسَاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ وَحِينَ الْبَأْسِ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُتَّقُونَ Righteousness is not in turning your faces in salah towards the east or the west. Rather, the righteous people are those who believe in Allah in the last day, the angels, the books and the prophets, those who give charity out of their cherished wealth to relatives, orphans, the poor, the needy travellers, beggars and for freeing slaves those who establish prayer and pay their zakah and keep the promises they make and those who are patient in times of suffering, calamities and hardships and in the heat of battle. It is they who are true in faith and it is they who are conscious and mindful of Allah. So this is the difference between the two. This is the difference between someone who just says that they are Muslim but in their hearts, they're not true believers. And here in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us that the true Muslims are the believers who believe in all of these things. Because when you believe in all of these things, and I've said this many times in my podcast, if you believe, truly believe in a last day, you're not going to harm anyone. You're not going to oppress anyone. You're not going to shame anyone. You're going to have compassion and empathy. And you're going to be very charitable towards people. And you're going to be helpful to people in times of hardships. You're not going to make their hardships worse by rubbing your blessings in their face. You're not going to be someone who does that. You're not going to be someone who gloats about what Allah gave you and the du'as Allah answered for you when you know that your brother or sister out there is suffering because they did not receive the same blessings. You're not going to be that type of person who will do something like that, who will make someone feel... That Allah doesn't love them because he didn't give them what he gave you. Allah gives us all rizq. Every single one of us has been appointed our rizq. And the rizq is not the same for everyone. Allah was za'ha. Like it's distributed. And it's distributed in accordance to our mission in life. So everyone has a purpose and a mission. And everyone will receive their rizq. In accordance to their purpose and mission in life. So for example, some people may never have children because those children may be a hindrance to your mission. Some people may not get a lot of money because that money may be a hindrance to your mission. It may distract you from your purpose. Having lots of money may lead you down a dark path of major sins and, and so on and so forth. Having a wife in this life or a husband in this life may have not been written for you because, again, they may have been a hindrance to your to your purpose in life. Everyone has rizq in accordance to what they need. So if Allah has blessed you with so much health but no children, then know that you needed that health and you needed that youth and that fitness to do what you have been assigned to do. We don't know what our mission is in life. And sometimes we may not know until the end of our life. How many scholars have died after writing their most important book? And how many people have died after helping someone in need? How many women have died in childbirth after giving birth to a child who has an important mission in this world? 
you don't know what your mission is. And that's why we need to have that tawakkul. Now, tawakkul, that trust in Allah, does not come when you say your shahada. It does not come just by you being a Muslim. And this is something a lot of people do not understand. Because let's say someone has particularly high iman, good for them, right? Someone has high iman and or they or they show that they have high iman in public, right? In their posts, in the way they present themselves, mashallah, iman is super high. And they write posts about tawakkul and again, you know, Allah doesn't owe you anything. If you do not have trust in Allah, then you know you're just a weak slave. You can be easily replaced by Allah. You're a nothing, you're a nobody. You know, if you do not have that trust in Allah, then you are the loser because Allah doesn't need you. This kind of information is crippling to someone who is on a journey of finding Iman, finding faith. And again, just because you are a Muslim does not mean that you have so much Iman. There is a journey for you to find that Iman. And the journey is actually through your hardships. It's through your hardships and I'll explain that in a moment. But I wanted to just say something really important because a lot of people forget about this. The Prophet Muhammad he told us that every child is born upon the fitrah. And the fitrah is, so the hum, Allah's human creation is made of four parts. The soul, the nafs, the physical body and the intellect. Okay, those are four components that make up the human creation. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam, السلام, he breathed into him from his spirit. And that's how the soul was created. Okay, the human soul was created from Allah's spirit. And that's why, you know, all the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be found, you know, elements of them can be found in us. So, you know, Allah is compassionate, we can have compassion. Allah is the most kind, we have kindness in us. Allah is, you know, knowledgeable, we have knowledge. So we all have a part of divine spirit within us. That's what makes humans so much more advanced than the jinn and the angels, okay? Because they did not have the ruh, the spirit of Allah, breathed into them. So, when every child is born upon the fitrah of having a soul that is connected to Allah, okay? The soul is what connects us to Allah. It has nothing to do with the nafs. Again, this is a huge translation problem. If you look at the verses about the nafs in the Quran, the word nafs is always translated to soul, which is not true. No soul will be accountable on the day of judgment because they're pure. It's from Allah's spirit. It's pure. So Allah gives every baby a soul so that this creation of Allah will find him in one way or another during their lifetime. And that's why you have a lot of people who search for God. They search for a divine purpose. They search for a higher being, a higher authority. That's how so many people convert to Islam and convert to other religions as well. Because it's their soul that directs them towards Allah, towards finding Allah. Their soul will lean towards things where the person finds themselves, you know, exploring spirituality, exploring you know, different religions until they come to the realization, wow, you know, there is a God. And Allah gives everyone that chance. Because in the hadith, the Prophet Muhammad said, every child is born upon the fitra and it is their parents who make them Jewish, Christian, Sikh, Hindu, Buddhist, atheist, whatever. And, you know, many people have said, you know, why is it that Allah favors some people to be born as Muslims and raised as Muslims and other children not. It's not about being favoured because you will find so many children growing up as Muslims in Muslim households and they become atheists as adults. They become rebellious or they may even join other sects or other religions because they're not convinced that Islam is the true religion because of a toxic Islamic upbringing that they had. So it doesn't mean that just because you have been raised in a Muslim family, that you will actually have a believer mindset as an adult. Whereas someone who was raised as a Sikh 
or a Hindu or a Christian may actually grow up to find Islam as an adult and be a better Muslim than people who were raised Muslim. Purely because Allah has created that person with a soul and he or she listened to that soul, allowed that soul to guide them back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah will guide whom he wills. I've seen so many sons and daughters of shiur go the complete opposite way and become atheist. Again, because of a toxic upbringing. Go back to my previous podcast about toxic Islamic upbringing and what it can do to children. It can push people out of Islam. And then you have people who grew up in non-Islamic households and in different religions and, and whatnot, and they become amazing Muslims. I've seen pastors and rabbis convert to Islam after them, you know, being the leaders of their communities. Allah will guide whom he wills, when he wills. Having iman, having that believing heart, is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are not automatically given it because you are a Muslim or because you've said the shahada. Belief in Allah and the last day and the angels and, you know, arkan al-iman, the six pillars of iman, the five pillars of Islam, all of these have to really sink deep into your heart and you have to live in accordance to those beliefs for you to become a believer. You can look Muslim all you want. You can practice and preach until the cows come home. But if you treat people badly, if you are an oppressor at home, if you beat your wife and your children, if you hold a woman hostage and not give her a divorce, if you are someone who treats their parents poorly, or if you're a parent and you abuse your children, even sexually abuse your children, and you claim to be Muslim, yeah, you will be identified as a Muslim, but not as a believer. There's a difference. There's a massive difference here. Allah's made it clear. Just because you're a Muslim does not make you a believer. And so the whole point of me saying this is that Iman comes in stages. And Muslims judge each other for the Iman that is not being presented or shown in times of hardships and calamities, okay? And again, you know, a lack of iman can show in people being jealous and envious of other people, you know, hating what other people have. And yeah, all of these things do come from a lack of belief. Even when you are angry with Allah, when you are upset with Allah, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It just means that the iman has not entered your heart yet at a level it's meant to. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Because Iman is a gift. It's not something we have control over. Allah is the one who changes the hearts. The Prophet Muhammad used to say to the Sahaba when they pray in sujood, to always say, Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qulubuna ala deenak. Which means, O turner of hearts, make my heart steadfast on your deen. Make it hold on to your deen, the belief. You know, the iman is the belief in you and what you're capable of doing. And, you know, the hereafter and everything that's been promised us. Because we don't know, we can't see it. We have to have iman for these things. Iman, having faith, is so incredible because you are believing in something you can't see right? It's, it's belief in the unseen. It is belief in a future that Allah has promised us. Because it's something to do with the unseen and the future, things that we both don't have any control over, it becomes very difficult to see the good in any hardship. And you know, the Prophet Muhammad he told the Sahaba, he said to them, you know, the generations that will come after me will be so beloved to Allah because they had prophets and we don't. So if we are practicing believing Muslims, even towards the end of time and when you know, the Day of Judgment occurs, then the Prophet Muhammad told them that we will actually have a very special status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we didn't have prophets, but we still believed in the Prophet Muhammad and all the prophets who came before him. We believed in the Qur'an. We believed in what Allah said. We believed in the existence of Allah and we had no proof. 
there was no prophet to help us with all of that like they had so you know iman when you have it it's a gift but just because you don't have it now doesn't mean you never will and it certainly doesn't mean that allah hates you because you do not feel that you have an adequate amount of iman to get you through life it doesn't mean that he hates you i mean you know look at the story of pharaoh for example i've mentioned the story of pharaoh a few times now but i want you to just understand that pharaoh was one of the worst human beings to walk on this earth okay one of the worst human beings but yet until the ocean was split Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept sending him signs so that he could have iman. Okay, like the locusts and, you know, the, the water that turned into blood and the frogs. Everything that happened, everything that happened in the time of Pharaoh to prove to Pharaoh that there is a, a God who exists, who is more powerful than him. Everything that happened, everything Allah sent, was sent for the purpose of instilling the iman in Pharaoh's heart but it was the arrogance it was the arrogance in Pharaoh's heart that would not accept any of the signs that Allah sent which were clearly divine signs he would not accept them as an invitation to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repent but Allah sent him signs until the splitting of the sea it was then it was only then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that's it, no more signs, I've split the sea for you, in front of your eyes, if Iman still hasn't entered your heart, you are damned, you are now cursed, and your and your fate is not good, you know, Abdullah ibn Amr narrated that the Prophet Muhammad said, Allah will accept the repentance of his slave, as long as the soul has not yet reached his throat, so when Pharaoh finally found himself in a very difficult hardship where he was stranded in the middle of the ocean and he was drowning and he called out to Allah for his help and he said, Amant, I believe, I believe that you are the Lord of the worlds and I am from the Muslims. And Allah says, no, the door of repentance has closed, khalas. You have been given so many chances to humble yourself and repent but the interesting thing about this story is that Pharaoh eventually found Iman, but it was too late when he did. And this actually teaches us that Iman is found in our hardships. So when you find yourself hitting rock bottom and you don't know how to solve a problem, you know, it could be any major calamity. You may have lost all your wealth. You may have lost your home. You may be in a state of desperation because your narcissistic husband's kicked you out of the house and you've got nowhere to go with four kids I've seen that trust me I've seen cases like that where the man is someone who goes to the masjid preaches you know gives Islamic lectures and everything and in the middle of the night kicked out his wife and his four children from the home because she answered back or did something like that and he tells her there's no money go and figure out life on your own there are people like this. So when you are in a point of desperation, that is actually when Allah invites you to Iman. If your Iman is low, it is when you come to a point in time where you have no one to rely on apart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you are not raised by empathic parents who taught you about Iman growing up, it's going to be very difficult for you to find it as an adult because you don't understand Allah's mercy, you don't understand Allah's love, you don't understand how even with Pharaoh, until the last moment, he gave him chances to find him and repent and, you know, taste that sweetness of Iman. He even wanted Pharaoh to taste it so that it could help him be a better person, right? It was too late. He doesn't want us to find it too late. So the hardships that we go through, where we find ourselves in desperation, and sometimes the hardships that are extended for long periods of time. So if you find yourself in poverty or single, without children, without family, without whatever. If you find yourself in that state of being for a very long period of time, 
Look at your Iman. Look at what Allah is trying to teach you in that lesson. Instead of hating Allah, try and look at the situation in a way where you ask yourself, where can I find Allah's love in this? What has Allah already given me in my life to be grateful for so that I stop complaining about what I don't have? An exercise I give my clients is to write down everything that's great about their life, even if you think your life sucks. Write down everything that's great about your life. I'll give you an example. You may be someone single, you don't have family, you don't have children, and you're just fed up of not being married, okay? When you look carefully into your situation, you will actually find that you have a lot of blessings that you just aren't focusing on. You have peace, you have freedoms, you don't have to worry about children, you don't have to go through child labour, you don't have to, you know, worry about kids upbringing and kids being rebellious and kids being rude. You don't have to deal with a problematic wife or a problematic husband. Allah has alleviated so many hardships from you that you cannot see because you're focusing on what you don't have. And you don't realise that there are so many people out there who are married, who do have children who have everything they want that you don't have, and they wish for your life. They wish for your life because they just want a moment of peace. They want freedom to travel. They want freedoms to like move abroad and you know, pursue a, a great career, but they can't because they've got a family. And they can't because you know, the wife wants to live near her family and she doesn't want to move abroad and she doesn't want to do this and... You have the freedoms to pursue other things in life that other people can't. But people become so fixated on what they don't have that it makes them depressed and it makes them feel that Allah is not answering their dua on purpose to punish them. When actually he's saving you from something because your mission is different. Your mission in life is different. You need to pursue that mission. You need to you know, explore life to find out what it is that Allah wants you to do and why children may have been a hindrance to you, why a husband or wife may have been a hindrance to you or pursuing that career or pursuing that higher education. Why did I never get that? Why was I never accepted to have that role in that company? Or why was I not accepted to study medicine? Because that's not your life mission. Your life mission is something different. And you will not die. Know this. Know this for sure. You will not die before you fulfill your mission in any way, shape or form. Whatever it is that you choose to do in life, whatever decisions you make in life, your path will always steer towards the purpose of your creation. Okay? Life will always steer back to that because Allah already has a mission for you. You're not going to die without fulfilling it. Period. It's not going to happen. So if this mission requires that you have no children to hinder your progress, you're not going to have them. And this is another thing that I tell people to do in exercises. Do not pray for things that are specific. Keep your dua general. You know, I, I hear a lot of people who preach and they say, you know, Allah is capable of everything, everything that you want. He's capable of answering every dua, every request. And that he actually does love for us to continuously pray to him and ask him for what we want, right? We know this. We know that Allah loves it when we call upon him, when we thank him, when we're grateful, when we need him, when we're desperate for his help. Allah wants us to always turn to him as the first point of call. Okay, because sometimes... You know, we rely on other people f to help us through our hardships and they can't. They don't have the ability to do that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can actually answer our dua through other people who are capable of helping us. So when we make a dua for Allah to get us out of a specific calamity or a hardship or a situation, he may fulfill that dua through other people. And people will just pop up out of nowhere with help. Um, so dua is answered in many different ways. So as you know, Allah may either retain it and keep it for you in the akhirah because 
it's not a part of your life mission. It cannot be a part of your life mission because it's a hindrance. Having lots of money, children, whatever you want could be a hindrance. And it may not be good for you, right? So it may be something that could lead you to major sins, could lead you to kufr, could lead you away from Islam, away from a moral lifestyle. So maybe you're asking for something just because other people have it. You know, I want millions of dollars as well in my bank account, you know, from my business. And sometimes you'll find that people work really hard on their business and it just doesn't make money. It doesn't make money. It's because it's not a part of your life mission. Either Allah's delayed it because it's not the right time for you to have that money. He wants you to mature a bit more. He's going to send you a couple of hardships for you to understand maybe the value of money. Or he wants you to see some narcissistic people you work with who are scamming and deceiving other people. He needs you to to figure out that you're working with those kinds of people first before you come into a lot of money so you can secure yourself. There are things Allah wants you to see before he gives you what you want. Because if Allah gives you everything you want, when you want it, it could completely destroy your life. It could completely destroy your life. So when Allah withholds something, when he withholds a dua, and let's say he saves it for the next 10 years, okay? So he's going to give it to you, but in 10 years' time, after you've learnt lessons about the narcissistic people around you who would have scammed you out of that money, after you learn lessons about raising your children in that particular area, after you learn the lessons of being married to someone who is narcissistic, then Allah will give you what you want. So you can enjoy your rizq. Because he doesn't want it to be a hardship for you. Sometimes what you pray for actually becomes your hardship. And what you pray for, you're not ready for. So maybe you're praying for the best husband in the world or the best wife in the world, but you're not a healed person. You're going to ruin the life of that person, of that empath, when when that person comes into your life. Allah knows that the empath doesn't deserve that. He will give you an empath when you've healed yourself. So you're not toxic with that person. So many unhealed people who are toxic are praying for empaths. But Allah will not give you an empath until you heal. And I know I'll get the question as to why empaths get sent to narcissists then. Again, Allah doesn't send empaths to narcissists. It's narcissists who attract these people. And Allah allows empaths to enter the lives of narcissists for them to learn a lesson. A very valuable lesson about self-worth and boundaries. So if you're an unhealed person, a very unhealed codependent, and or maybe you're narcissistic and you're a low-level narcissist who still has the ability to make dua and pray, and you're praying for an empath or a pious spouse or a pious wife, you're not going to get that person because you're not ready for him or her. And, you know, this can apply to so many things, so many things. You're either not ready for receiving your risk because if you receive that wonderful person, you're going to mess it up. And Allah doesn't want you to go through that hardship and turmoil of messing up something so good. So he delays it for when you're ready or he retains it for the akhirah because it's not meant to be a part of your path to your mission. Or he does not give it to you because it's harmful for you and he replaces it with something better. So you may pray for Someone specific to marry. Oh Allah, give me this specific person. And Allah's like, no, not that person. I'll give you someone better. And someone better will come along and alhamdulillah, you'll have a better life. Some people can't accept that. Some people will say, no, I wanted that person. Why did Allah give me this person to marry and not that person who I prayed for? Why did the person I prayed for go and marry someone else? Allah hates me. And they go, you know, they go down that dark path. There has to be, you know, there has to be this journey that you take for you to understand what tawakkul in Allah is, trust in Allah. And it comes in different stages because everyone has different hardships. Muslims who are judgmental of each other are judgmental of each other because they do not go through the same hardships. And it's something that really irritates me because when a woman... For example, who has full hijab, full niqab, full everything, judges another woman 
for not wearing the hijab at all. She doesn't know. She hasn't experienced the same hardships that a woman has gone through for her to not be wearing hijab or to have taken it off. Lots of women are tested with their hijab. Lots of women are tested with their health. Lots of men are tested, you know, by not having children and not having a family. Everyone is tested in different ways. So, you know, there's that saying that sinners judge people's sins because they sin differently. It's the same with judging people on their hardships. How do you know how it feels to not have a family? Or how do you know how it feels to live in a, in a community where you could be attacked for wearing a hijab? How do you know how it feels to not have children or not have money, to live in poverty, you know, whatever, whatever the hardship is? So a lot of Muslims get on that high horse because they have everything that they want, or, or so they say, or so they present to social media. And they look down upon people who are angry with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they don't have what those people have. And they say, and they gloat, and like, where's your iman? It's because they haven't been tested in the same way. And I have always, always found without fail, if you judge somebody based on the sin that they have committed, and you look down upon them because of the sin that they have committed, Allah will test you with that too. I know someone who has four daughters, okay? And she's very strict, a very strict Muslim. I think she's too strict, but whatever. She raised her daughters to be very devout Muslim women. She did a good job with it, okay? She did a good job with protecting them. You know, they all wear the hijab and niqab and everything. They live in London. And she used to really look down upon other Muslim mothers who had daughters who didn't wear hijab. You know, they used to go partying. They used to have boyfriends and all of that. And she used to look down upon them and say, Allah loves me more. He gave me children who listen to me. They're compliant. They're obedient. She's very narcissistic, by the way. Compliant, obedient. They don't do wrong. None of them have boyfriends. And they, you know, they all wear the hijab. And she used to make other people feel really bad about their parenting. And she would tell them, you know, there's something wrong with your iman. What's wrong with your daughters? Alhamdulillah, my daughters are not like this, 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 this. She used to rub it in everyone's face that my daughters are better than everybody. I raised them the best. Until one by one, her daughters slipped off that path. None of them wear hijab now. One of them has got pregnant by some English boyfriend. One of them is tattooed head to toe. One of them is into partying and drugs. I think the fourth one's a lesbian or something. All of them, all of them fell off the wagon completely. And she is the talk of the town. Everyone laughs at her. Everyone's like, oh, do you remember when she used to be on her high horse and, you know, tell us about our kids and how we, you know, didn't raise them properly. And subhanAllah, the women whom she criticised, their daughters found Islam growing up. Their daughters married well, they had children, they had families, and, you know, it was, you know, their daughters had gone through some sort of phase as teenagers or whatever, but alhamdulillah, they came back. A lot of them came back, but her daughters all fell off the wagon, and they fell off the wagon. Some people might say, oh, well, you know, why is it the fault of the daughters to carry? It's not the fault of the daughters, it's because she was so narcissistic and so military in her raising of them that they all rebelled against her as soon as they got the chance, as soon as they had that freedom. So they were just waiting for an opportunity to break out of their mother's chains and do what they wanted. They were not who they were presented to be. Deep inside, they had a hate for their mother and how strict she was, you know, how suffocating she was when she raised them with, you know, um, unbearable Islamic laws that they just couldn't follow. They weren't able to follow so be careful who you talk about. Be careful who you look down upon. Don't be on that high horse just because you haven't been through the same hardships and experiences as someone else. It's very easy to say to somebody, you should have Iman when you haven't experienced the hardship they've gone through. You haven't experienced 
how it feels to not have a loving mother or a caring father or to have a family, to be completely on your own. You know, you're on your high horse. You've got your, you know, you've got your family, your caring father and everything. And you look down upon women because they're struggling with their iman, not looking at the context and the background of, you know, where they've come from and what they've had to go through. Allah does not burden anyone with more than they can handle. When Allah gives you a hardship, he already knows it's something you can handle. You just need to find the positive hidden gems in those, you know, in those hardships that he gives you so that you can learn. Yeah, it's a crisis when you find out that your best friend is a narcissistic user and, you know, she's gone behind your back and she's talking to your husband. But wouldn't you rather have known than not know? That could be a crisis for some people because they lose their best friend in the process. But look at the positive side of it, which is, Alhamdulillah, Allah showed me who that person is. They can leave, they can exit my life. Always look for the positive so that you can grow that iman in your heart. Because I promise you, all those people who are judging you for not having high iman wouldn't survive, wouldn't survive the hardships that you go through. Allah hasn't given it to them because they wouldn't survive them. You are actually more powerful than a lot of women and a lot of men who have everything that they want. And subhanAllah, they're just given, you know, they're given things in life that aren't tests for them. Because you are more powerful than them. Because you are able to live without those things. You are able to survive without having a supportive community. Without having a lot of money. Alhamdulillah, you're content with very little. They can't be content. They have lived a life of luxury for a very long time. They, they find it too hard to downgrade. And when Allah hits them with that calamity of loss of wealth, believe me, they are the ones who are going to look at you and envy you for being able to handle your calamity very well while they lose their iman. People who shame others when it comes to their iman will eventually lose their iman at some point in time. It comes round to them because Allah needs to give them a taste of what it feels like to be in that person's shoes. Oh, you're judging that person because of their low iman, low trust in Allah, low hope for the future. Okay, I'm going to put you in a situation where you feel the same. Something's going to be taken away from you so that you can feel compassion for that person. And it's not a punishment. It's not a punishment for that person either. I don't believe Allah actually punishes anybody for these things in this dunya. Because these are all a consequence of our own doing. Allah just gives us the consequences. He lets us live the consequences of our actions so we learn. But people see them as punishments. The consequences of our actions are seen as punishments. So when Allah gives the same hardship or the same taste of a loss of iman to someone else who has judged someone else for not having it, the whole point of it is to teach that person some empathy, some compassion, to humble them and take them off that high horse, to make them better. Not as a punishment, it's to make them better. The humbling experience is always a life-changing one. And that's why narcissists will never change until they get hit with that life-changing humbling experience. It's not a punishment. It's a way for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to knock some empathy into that person so that they can no longer live their life as a narcissistic individual. But if you allow your qareen and your arrogance to overpower you, you won't. You won't see it. And you'll continue and continue and they will just, you know, Allah will then allow them to just go into their own blindness. They will move through life in complete blindness, deaf, dumb and blind like cattle. No matter what you say to these people, nothing sinks. Nothing sinks in. They are deaf, dumb and blind like cattle. You can advise them, you can help them, you can fix them, you can, you know, be their hero if you want to. But it doesn't do anything because they are deaf, dumb and blinded by their arrogance, by their qareen. 
So Allah will send them humbling experiences until they wake up. That's why you can't help a narcissist. Because their arrogance is usually too far gone for any of that. So it's easier for the narcissistic individuals to just tell everybody, Allah hates you. Because that's how they feel about themselves. They truly believe that Allah hates them. And that's why they can't get better. Allah doesn't hate them. Allah has given them so many chances, but they don't want to do the work. They don't want to do the work that's needed and the changes that are needed to get better. They don't want to do it. It's too much work, too much effort. They can't be bothered. So it's easier to tell other people, you have a problem with Allah. You have a problem with your Iman. You are the one who's not going to a good place. Because, you know, you have no tawakkul. You're upset that your diets weren't answered. You're upset that life didn't turn out the way you wanted it to turn out. Who's, who's to say everyone is meant to have the same life? Who said that? Who told everybody that your life has to be a specific way for you to be considered a worthy and successful human being? Allah has already told us, not everyone will get married. Not everyone will have children. Many women will be barren. Every woman has a womb. Doesn't mean that womb will carry a child. Doesn't mean that everyone will have money if you work hard. But toxic societies, Muslim societies, have ingrained it in people that if you do not have a husband by a certain age or a wife and you do not have children and you do not have a good career and you are not highly educated and you're not this and you're not that, then you're a failure. Who's to say? Who the hell are they to say that? When Allah holds our risk. The reason why people are depressed is because they are listening to the rubbish that is being dictated in toxic cultures. Period. Because they are telling you to live a life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not written for you. Your mission is different from everyone else. Look at Aisha radiallahu anha. She was the youngest of the Prophet Muhammad wives. She didn't have any children because her mission in life was to be a scholar. Her mission in life was to teach men and women. She was the one who, you know, compiled all of the narrations that she had about life with the Prophet Muhammad and she needed to teach that. That was more important than her having children. Allah willed for the lineage of the Prophet Muhammad to come through Khadija, radiallahu anha, because she didn't have the same mission as Aisha. So, you know, does that make her a woman who is unworthy because she didn't have children and she didn't have, you know, lin her own lineage to pass on? But look at the knowledge that people are still taking from her until now. She's still remembered. She's still, you know, people are still making dua for her. People are still using her teachings to learn about the Prophet Muhammad Her mission in life was different. Her purpose in this dunya was different. Not everyone will get the same risk. It doesn't matter how much you slave away at your business. If that risk is not meant for you, it will not come for you. And someone else may not work as hard. May not work as hard on their business. But subhanAllah, they just make a lot of money. Because that risk was meant for them. Maybe with that money, they could help somebody in need. Or, you know, they do whatever they need to do with it. It could be a blessing or a curse, depending on how they use it. So the consequences of our actions come as a result of our poor decisions that we make in life. Rather than Allah punishing us just for the sake of it. Just for the hell of it. Why would Allah do that? Because we have low iman. Always remember the way we look at things will affect our iman. What we listen to will affect our iman. When we take what other people say to heart, when we don't understand narcissism, when we don't understand that there are lots of jealous and envious people out there, very judgmental people on their high horse who haven't been what we've been through and they judge us for it, doesn't mean that our iman has to stay weak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Imran in verse 182, this is for what your hands have brought forth and because Allah is never unjust to his servants. 
And this ayah was directed to the Jews at the time because they were never grateful for anything that Allah sent them. And so the rebellion that they kept showing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought forth consequences, right? It, you know, it brought calamities and hardships for them. And they were blaming Allah for those hardships when Allah said, no, I'm not unjust to anybody. I will never send you hardships just for the sake of it. I will never send you calamities just for the, just for the hell of it. This is a consequence of what you have done. And if I do not show you the consequences, you are not going to learn. So don't think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends you hardships because he hates you. And there is more evidence for this in the Quran. If you look at Surah Al-Duha, okay? Surah Al-Duha was directed at the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu but when he was feeling really low, really low. And Allah wanted to comfort him in this surah. So he says, Wa he swears by the morning sunlight. Wa layli idha saja, and he swears again by the night when it falls very still. Ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma qala. Your Lord, O Prophet, has not abandoned you, nor has he become hateful of you. This indicates that, that is how the Prophet Muhammad was feeling at the time. He felt that Allah had abandoned him and that Allah hated him, didn't like him, didn't love him. Even the Prophet felt this. So it's normal to feel like this. It's not an indication that something is terribly wrong with you. You just haven't found Iman yet. I'll come on to that inshallah after the surah. وَلَا الْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى And the next life is certainly far better for you than this one. So all the calamities that you are facing, O Prophet, all the hardships, all the things from the dunya, the pleasures of this dunya that you do not have, they're going to be safe for you in the next life. The next life is better than this one. It's a short temporary life, you know. Um, don't be sad about it. The next life is better. It's a promise. And surely your Lord will give you so much that you will be so pleased. So again, this is an indication that the Prophet Muhammad feels very deprived. He feels deprived of what he needs or what he wants. And Allah is reassuring him that he will give him so much until his heart becomes so content that that day is coming. Alam fa'awa. Did he, like Allah, did he not find you as an orphan and sheltered and protected you? And did he not find you unguided and then guided you? And did he not find you needy and then satisfied your needs at that time? So don't oppress the orphan. And do not refuse or turn away the beggar. And proclaim the blessings of your Lord. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him here to focus on the blessings. Have I not given you this and done this for you? Why have you lost hope? Don't lose hope. I haven't abandoned you and I haven't forgotten about you and I don't hate you. It's all good. Always remember what I've done for you and that more is coming. Just not now. Just not now. And that the calamity and the hardship of a believer is never a punishment. It's never a punishment. There's always good in the hardship. When you find the positive lessons in the hardship, when you understand that this hardship is a part of your journey towards your purpose, you won't see it as Allah taking it away from you or Allah disliking you or Allah not being pleased with you. You have to understand that everyone finds Iman at different stages of life. Everyone finds Iman at different stages of life. Some people may find Iman in their teens. Some people in early adulthood. 
Some people in their 30s, some in their 40s, some in their 50s, some in their 60s and 70s. But if Allah has written Iman to enter your heart, it will enter your heart even in your 70s and 80s. It will come. But you have to want it. You have to seek it. Okay? So that is why you cannot judge other people for not having a level of Iman as high as yours at that point in time. Everyone's at different stages of Iman. Tawakkul, trust in Allah, happens when you go through a hardship and then you see the reasons why Allah did not allow you to have something or why Allah did that. You know, sometimes, for example, a plane might get delayed and you were so desperate to get on that plane because you had, you know, somewhere to go, somewhere important to go. But it's been delayed by three hours, only to find out later that the place where you were meant to be, subhanAllah, got, I don't know, hit by an earthquake. Or some natural disaster happened in that area and you were saved from it. There is always a khair, there's always a blessing and a delay, if you believe so. Okay, every time something is delayed for you, so you need to change your mindset to understand that there's a delay because Allah is removing harm from your future. You know, he's diverting you from something that is not good for you. So delays are khair, delays are a blessing. And the removal of what you want is also a blessing. And sometimes, like I said, you may want something so badly or you may go through such a difficult hardship only to find later, wow, had I done that or had I had that, that is what would have happened to me. Maybe you see it happen, happening to someone else. Maybe you see that hardship or calamity hitting someone else. Wow, if I'd gone down that route in my career, I wouldn't be wearing hijab anymore. I wouldn't be praying anymore if I pursued that career. If I had that much money, maybe I would have, you know, blown it all on haram relationships and zina and, and, the, and alcohol. I could have been a drug addict by the end of it. Always look for the positive. Because that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught the Prophet Muhammad sallam in Surah Al-Duha. Another thing I come across, well, another situation is when a lot of women and men, they really hate that they have children from narcissistic abusers. And they feel like these children are now a burden on them. Okay, Allah, why did you give me these children from such a horrible man? Why did you do this? Why, you know, I'm stuck now with this child. And it's been a nightmare co-parenting with this narcissistic ex. He or she makes my life hell every day. Every day I get abuse. Every day I get unnecessary, you know, calls and texts because of this child. I wish I never had this child. You have no idea what the purpose of this child in your life is yet. You may lose everything and everybody and only have this child as an elderly person to look after you. Or this child may be your sadaqa jariya if you raise them well. Maybe this is the only person who will pray for you after your death. Your sadaqa jariya. You don't know. Or maybe this child will be very successful you know, later in life, and their success will come to you. They will be able to give you a wonderful lifestyle as the single parent who raised them. I mean, I know somebody and she went through some serious hardships raising a son on her own because she had to deal with a horrible, vile, narcissistic ex. And somehow this uh, child grew up to be a surgeon and the mother grew up living very tightly you know, tiny flat, she raised him to the best of her ability, and subhanAllah, he, he was just very smart, very smart boy, he grew up, uh, got accepted into medical school, and he's now a very well-known surgeon, travels the world, and gives speeches everywhere, and uh, subhanAllah, his salary is so high, he's given his mother the most amazing lifestyle, like mashallah, she lives in absolute luxury right now, because of her son, not because of anyone else, so you don't know, you actually don't know who 
is going to be your blessing. And that's why when Allah gives you a child from someone who is so abusive, there's a hikmah behind that, there's a wisdom. Allah will turn that child from a very unfortunate situation into a blessing. And if the child ends up being a hardship, then it will be the taking away of so many sins, inshallah, so many sins. But that child has a purpose. That child was born with a purpose. Always believe that. Suhaib radiallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet Muhammad said, عَجَبًا لَأَمْرٍ مُؤْمِنٍ إِنْ أَمْرُهُ كُلَّهُ خَيْرٍ وَلَيْسَ ذَاكَ لِأَحَدٍ إِلَّا لِمُؤْمِنٍ إِنْ أَصَابَتُهُ سَرَّاءً شَكَرَ فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ ضَرَّاءٌ صَبَرَ فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ Wondrous is the affair of the believer, for there is good for him or her in every matter, in every situation. And this is not the case with anyone except for the believer. If they are happy, then they thank Allah, and there is good for them in that. And if they are harmed, or they are distressed, and they show patience, then there is also good in that for them. So this is only a mindset of a believer, okay? Train your mindset to be that of a believer. Instead of looking at the situation as Allah hates you, and maybe other people are right in saying that Allah doesn't love me because he hasn't answered my dua, hasn't given me what I want, ignore all of that rubbish. That all comes from narcissistic people. Only someone with very little empathy and compassion for others and the hardships of others would say something like that. People who are jealous and envious will say things like that. Everyone has their hardships and struggles in accordance to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has portioned for them. Okay? So always remember that. Always remember that there is khair in every hardship only for the believer. If you are not a believer... If you are a, you know, someone who hates Allah, you don't even care about how you treat other people, then yes, it's going to be looked at as a punishment. And that's why the darkness grows in narcissists. The darkness grows because they know they're going to be punished. They know they're going to face a horrible fate. But they don't want to change. And you get people as well who, who say, you know, well, the prophets were perfect. You know, the prophets didn't have any iman issues. These are people who are very uneducated who say this because they surely did. This is an example in Surah Al-Duha. There are many examples of things that happened to the prophets, the situations they were put in that made them depressed, that made them doubtful of Allah, that made them feel burdened by the tasks that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had assigned to them. I mean, look at Yunus alayhi salam when he really tried with his people and... They just rebelled against him. They were rude to him. They were vile to him, vulgar. And he was like, screw this. I can't do this. I'm not doing this anymore. I've had enough. And he ran away from his people. He was angry. He was angry. He was frustrated. He was irritated. And he ran away because he couldn't deal with it anymore. And he ran away to another problem. And this story of Yunus salam teaches us that if you run from one problem, you'll run into another and the second problem that he ran into was landing himself in the belly of a whale because he jumped into a boat when he got to the sea out of hope that he could cross the sea and just basically disappear. Disappear and get away from them. And then Allah commanded the whale to swallow Yunus just to calm him down. He was in such a state of anger and distress that Allah needed to send the whale to calm Yunus down. It wasn't a punishment. And he wasn't intending to keep Yunus in the belly of the whale. He just wanted Yunus to understand that when you run from one problem, you will find yourself in another. You have to face the problem at hand and you need to solve it. You need to solve the problem because you will just start accumulating problems and that's what narcissists do. They continuously run away from their problems and run from relationship to relationship without resolving all the problems that happened in the previous one. So they never learn from their mistakes. They repeat the same cycle again and again and again. And it gets worse every year. Every year they get more toxic. Every year they become more burdened with the accumulation of damage that they cause themselves and other people. So the whale was sent to Yunus to calm him down so he could reflect self-reflection. Is this a hardship from Allah? Is this something I can handle? 
is this something that Allah has given me that I am unable to do? You know, Allah comforted him. I've given you this task because I know you're capable of doing it. I wouldn't have chosen you if you were not capable of it. Musa alayhi salam was the same when you know he, he said to Allah, I've got a problem with my speech. Someone else is better in my place. Allah chose him because he knew that Musa alayhi salam was the best person to go to Fir'aun and teach him about Allah's power ta'ala so he could stop his oppression. But at the time, there were many prophets who just couldn't who couldn't understand why Allah would choose them for a specific mission. We don't know what missions we are given in life. Allah gives everyone a specific mission so that, you know, so that the job can get done. You may not even know that you have the capability of doing it, but Allah gives it to you. Allah gives you the capability of doing it. He helped Musa, alayhi salam, with his speech. He helped Yunus to understand that running away from his problems isn't going to get him anywhere good. But he needs to calm down. He needs to remember why Allah sent him on his mission. And why Allah chose him to do it. Because he's capable of doing it. Allah calmed all of them down. Look in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 260. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّي أَرِنِي كَيْفَ تُحِيَ الْمَوْتَى قَالَ أَوَلَمْ تُؤْمِنْ قال بلى ولكن لا يطمئن قلبي قال فخذ أربعة من الطير فصرهن إليك ثم اجعل على كل جبل منهن جزءا ثم أدعهن يأتينك سعيا واعلم أن الله عزيز حكيم and remember when Ibrahim عليه السلام said my lord show me how you give life to the dead Allah responded do you not believe Ibrahim said, yes, I do, but just so that I can be reassured that you really can. Allah said, then bring four birds, train them to come to you, then cut them into pieces and scatter them on different mountain tops. Then call them back and they will fly to you in haste. And so you will know for sure that Allah is almighty, all wise. Now, put yourself in this situation where Ibrahim alayhi salam is talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the worlds, you're speaking to the Lord of the worlds. He's created everything. And Ibrahim says to him, he just cannot comprehend how life can be brought back from the dead. He just can't get his head around it. So he says to Allah, you need to show me so that my heart can be reassured. This is someone who is speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already. Did Allah get mad? Did Allah get upset or offended? Did he say, how dare you? How dare you doubt me? How dare you ask me this? I am the Lord of the worlds. How arrogant are you? He didn't. He's like, fine. I'll show you. He didn't get mad. Like a lot of people would actually these days if you were to ask them to prove something. It's like going to Jeff Bezos and asking him to prove that he's wealthy. Everyone knows he's wealthy. Everyone knows how he made his money. So it's ridiculous to actually go and ask Jeff Bezos to prove that he is indeed wealthy when everyone knows it. It's the same with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibrahim alayhi salam knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created the universe, but yet he needed reassurance on this particular matter. Allah did not get upset with him. So this shows us that it's normal to have doubts. It's normal to feel upset with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes. It's normal to feel anger, resentment when you see that other people are getting what you've been praying for. All of this is normal. It's a normal part of human nature, okay? It's a normal part of human nature to be going through these emotions. It doesn't make you a bad person. But remember, your environment will really affect how you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you are in an environment or a community that faith shames a lot, you will eventually get affected by it. If you are someone who is addicted to social media and you are always watching what people post, you're watching other Muslims rub it in your face, all the wealth they have and the kids they have and the amazing husband they have and the most beautiful wife they have. If you are 
someone who obsessively watches these videos, your iman will get affected if you cannot find the blessings in your own situation. And another thing that I, you know, I advise people to do when they come to me as clients is to stop praying for things specifically. This will greatly help your iman. Now, a lot of people say, you know, pray for whatever you want. Allah is capable of everything. If you want something specific, pray for it. If you want this, pray for it. If you want that, pray for it. I advise people not to do that. Even though I know Allah is capable of all of it, but what will happen is that you will hang on to that dua for so long and if you don't get it, it will chip away at your iman. Because like I said before, it may be that you are praying for something that's not good for you. Okay, Allah says, perhaps you may love something or want something and it's bad for you. And perhaps you may hate something or not want something, but it is indeed khair for you. It's a blessing for you. Allah knows and you do not know. So do not pray for something specific. Do not pray to get married that year. Do not pray to have four children. Do not pray to have that particular job. Do not pray to have, you know, X amount of money by the end of the year or don't pray for these things specifically. Pray for what's good for you. Pray for what is khair for you. Whatever has been written for you, the rizq that is given to you, Ya Allah, give me that and better. Give me that and better. Give me what's good for me and better as well. In this life and the next. Keep it open. Because what happens to people when they focus on a specific dua is like I said, they cling on to it so hard a year will pass, and then two years, three years, four years, ten years, and it hasn't happened. And now you're thinking, I've prayed to Hajjud, I've prayed on Arafat day, I've prayed in Ramadan, I've prayed in Laylatul Qadr, I've prayed in Jum'ah, and I still haven't got it. I still haven't got what I wanted. Allah hates me. You see how, how the shaitan can allow you to slip into that way of thinking? Because you're so hung on something that's not meant for you. Or maybe Allah saved better for you. Or he's retained it for you in the next life. Or he's removed it from your life because it's a harmful thing that you're asking for. Marrying that person is going to destroy your life. I'm not going to give it to you. So don't pray for things that are specific. When you allow it to be open, you will know after that, whatever comes into your life is khair. Whatever exits your life is khair. Because that's what you've prayed for. You've prayed for good to come to you and harm to be removed from you. Sometimes when we pray for things we so badly want and Allah does not give them to us, he compensates by removing a harm in its place. A harm is removed from your future. Maybe an illness is removed from your body that you're not aware of. Maybe a car crash that was planned in your future is taken away because... Allah knows how badly you wanted that specific dua to be answered. But because he knows it's not good for you, he's going to remove a harm in its place. So do not panic. Do not be distressed. Do not feel despair when your dua is not answered because there is khair in it. Seek that iman and you'll find it. Allah will put you on a journey, a spiritual journey, where you will find that iman. And you, like I said, usually it's in the answer as to why something was prevented from you. Why it was prevented, you know, from you having it. You will see. I'm telling you, you'll see it. You'll have those aha moments where it's like, wow, I'm so glad I didn't get on that plane. I'm so glad I didn't go on that holiday. I'm so glad I don't have that kind of money. I'm so glad I live a simple life and I'm not tested with my wealth like other people are. I'm so glad I don't have fame because other women who have fame took off their hijab and they lost their iman. I'm so glad I don't have children because I couldn't deal with all those hardships. I have freedoms. I've got peace at home. I don't have to worry about children. I'm so glad I'm not married to my ex because I no longer have to deal with all that narcissistic rubbish. A lot of people, they, you know, they, they cry over their marriage ending even though, you know, the ex was a toxic person. But because they feel so ashamed in society for being a divorced man or woman, sometimes they wish that they were just back with their ex. 
said, alhamdulillah, you're not still with them. Wallah, there are people living in toxic marriages who would die to be single again. They beg to be single again and have a, a life that does not include the worries that they have. But again, Allah allows them to be able to handle those worries and handle those calamities. But you're, you can't. You're unable to. Allah knows that if you had children and you were a single dad or a single mom, you wouldn't handle it. So he's not giving it to you. He's not giving you those hardships. People are given different hardships in different points in life because it's what you can handle. So the next time someone comes to you to faith shame you, or oh, you should have more iman at your age. You know, with all the knowledge you have, it's a bit weird that you don't have enough iman or high iman. It doesn't matter how much knowledge you have. You could be a alima, you could be a alim, a scholar, a sheikh, and iman still won't enter your heart. And that's why we have a lot of, you know, narcissists who are able to teach the deen, whether in a good way or a bad way, but they do things that completely contradict what they teach because iman has not entered their heart fully yet. You could be a person of knowledge and still that iman's not there. Don't allow outside perceptions of the deen, you know, of what people want to present as being a religious, pious facade, fool you into believing that just because they dress that way or act that way or go to the mosque, you know, X times every week, that they are pious people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Shu'ara, Ayah 88, that only the people who have clean, pure hearts will be saved. It's not about what you look like. It's not about how many times you pray to Hajjud. Yeah, all of these things help. If you can do them, you should do them. Do the voluntary prayers, you know, fast whenever you can for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, do good things. Go for Umrah if you can afford it. But just because you do those things does not mean you're a believer or a good person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, speaks in this surah about the Day of Judgment where he says, يَوْمٍ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ That the Day of Judgment will be a day when wealth and your children, who you bragged about so much, will not be there to help you or save you. Okay? They're not going to be there to save you. The only thing that will save you is this. إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهُ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ But only the one who comes to Allah with a sound heart will be saved. That's it. Allah just wants you to come to him with a sound heart. Does that mean that it's okay to not wear hijab completely and have a sound heart? No. Does it mean that it's okay to not pray your five times a day but still have a good heart? No. Because we are given rituals that bring us closer to Allah you know, things that we're meant to do. There are rules and regulations that we need to follow in the best way that we can. But the most important part of who we are as Muslim believers needs to be our sound heart. So if you are someone who just hates everybody, you know, you have that haqt towards everybody, that hasad, that, you know, you give everyone ayn, you give everyone, you know, you do black magic on people and you talk badly about people all the time and you know, you ridicule people because of their iman. If you do that on a regular basis, you do not have a qalb salim. You don't have it. You, I'm telling you, you could look like Mother Teresa for all I care. You are not a believer in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you are someone who harms other people with your ayn, giving people so much hasad without saying, mashallah, you know, mafi dhikr Allah and... You know, so many people are being affected by hasad in, in our generation. It's unbelievable. And it always comes from people, you know, who just claim to be so religious. I see it so much, like, where there's so much bitterness and resentful energy that goes towards, you know, Muslims who aren't as strict, but they live happier lives. It's always those really strict Muslims who are so freaking miserable, who hate everyone else. The hasad and that you know the ayn that is happening to people and loads of ruqya practitioners are talking about it now. They're saying we have an epidemic of hasad right now. You know you've got to be really careful. Stop bragging about what you have. Don't, don't expose what blessings Allah gave you. 
to the outside world on social media because wallahi al-azim, the hasad that's going around now is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Like the evil eye that's being shot at. You know, people who have any kind of blessings. I'm seeing children die, you know, in social media. Children get suddenly sick. But, you know, pets dying, all of it. I'm telling you, I'm seeing it. Because any indication that you are happy, even if it's nothing to particularly be envious of, right? You might be sat in your tiny flat and you've got your candles on and you took a picture of it and you're like, alhamdulillah for peace. Ah, someone's giving you hazard for that. Because they don't have peace right now. Even if it's something that you wouldn't even think of, you know, as being something to be envied. Because you don't even see yourself living a life that's worth being envied, right? But you post something like that, and then the next day, you're really sick. The next day, you've got problems. There's an Arabic saying that the envious people will envy the eyebrows on a bald man. (laughs) They will find anything to be envious of. Any indication that you are content with your life, happy with your life, even if you have very little... They'll give you hazard for it. There are too many people out there with so much darkness in their hearts that you need to protect yourselves from. You need to read your azkar morning and night. Morning and night. Because the evil energy that's out there from Iblis and his soldiers, shayateen al-ins, shayateen al-jinn, all this demonic energy that's around us is affecting a lot of people. A lot of good people as well. Don't forget your morning and evening athkar. Your qareen will always try to make you forget about them, by the way. You may wake up with the intention to read them and then you get distracted by something. You might get distracted by your child or, you know, text messages or a phone call. Always make sure that you make that a part of your daily routine to protect yourself with athkar. And I'll mention it again, um, as I did before in my previous podcast, even if you go for ruqya, Read your adhkar before you go. Because if the raqi deals with the jinn, he will not or she will not be able to affect you negatively. They will not be able to do the raqya on you. Always do your adhkar before you leave the house, before you enter the bathroom. You know, just read your dua. Allahumma ni'udhu bik min al khubthi wal khaba'ith. Don't forget these necessary adhkar that you need. Don't post things unnecessarily on social media. People will envy you for the little that you have, that makes you happy, that helps you get through your dark days and calamities. Because what's going to happen is if they give you ain on the little things that you have that are good and you lose that as well, you're going to go into a very dark place. Don't post things. Don't post things. I learned that. Trust me, I learned that. To never post anything. like Don't even post restaurants. Don't post food. People have illnesses that they do not know about because they constantly post food from high-end restaurants and people are giving them hazard for it. They're getting IBS and all sorts of digestive problems because they don't realise that it's all coming from the ayin and hazard of people. Don't post your children. Don't post newborns. Don't post anything that makes you super happy. Because unfortunately we live in a time where... If you lose your faith as a result of the ayn and hasad that takes away your blessings, it will cause you to lose some of your iman as well. So always remember that you also have a duty upon yourself to protect yourself and to protect the happiness and the blessings and what little iman you may have. You have to protect it. Because believe me, there are so many people out there who want to take it from you. They want to take it from you. They want you to think badly of Allah. They want you to never find that iman. That is the mission of Junud Iblis. Junud Iblis, the soldiers of Iblis, that is their mission. For you to be completely depleted. Always remember that Iblis wants nothing more than for you to lose hope in the mercy and love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you commit sins, for example, whether they be in public or private, you will get those whispers from al-waswas al-khannas, right? The whispers of your qareen who tell you, 
oh, there's no point praying today because you've sinned. Your prayers are not going to be accepted. And then that drags on to the next day and the next day and the next day. And before you know it, you're now getting into a habit of sinning and justifying not praying anymore and not having hope in Allah's mercy. You, you, you know, your qareen is telling you, well, seeing as you're sinning all this much, then you're going to look like a hypocrite in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you, you know, when you pray and you repent because you keep doing the same things again and again and again. So a lot of people, especially narcissistic people, they jump on that bandwagon of justifying why they no longer pray because they no longer have hope. And that's what their satanic qareen tells them. You're destined for hell. There's no point in you changing. There's no point in you getting better. You're already destined to go to hell with me. So don't even bother trying anymore. And that's why narcissists get worse and worse and worse because that's what their qareens keep telling them. Narcissists always believe that they are not worthy of Allah's love, that they are not worthy of his mercy and that Allah does not like them. Allah wants to punish them. When I have had sessions with narcissists, low-level narcissists in particular, like man children and women children, one common thing that they always say to me is, I don't feel worthy of Allah's love because I've done so much harm to people, so much caused so much damage and I just see no point in praying. That is where your qareen needs to get you. When you reach that point in your spiritual journey where you, you give up on Allah, you give up on yourself and you just continue with your abusive ways and your oppression, then your qareen has won over you. So every time you get those whispers, always remember they are satanic whispers to hinder you from your progress. Even if you're sinning, continue to pray. Even if you're sinning, continue to fast. You may feel like a hypocrite, but you need to hold on to that rope. You need to hold on to that rope with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you will get out of it eventually when you stop listening to your qareer. So a lot of people may mock those who sin when they see them praying in the masjid or fasting in Ramadan. They say, what are you praying for? Why do you even bother fasting? You've done X, Y, Z and now you're praying. You're such a hypocrite. You're such a two-faced so-and-so. When actually the Prophet Muhammad he encouraged people to continue praying and continue fasting and continue making dua even when you're sinning. Because if you completely cut yourself from prayers and fasting and, and any connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you only sin, that's what will escalate. You will escalate in your major sins. And you will find it really hard to come back after that and find a connection with Allah. And that's what's happened to a lot of narcissists. They don't know how to establish a connection with Allah. If you're in that situation, I've recorded podcasts about it. Just go through the collection and you'll find it there how to elevate your nafs and how to get rid of your narcissism and come back to Allah okay it's all there so that's what happens when you lose hope in Allah and hope in his mercy you cannot you cannot lose hope in his mercy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that even if your sins are you know as, as big as a mountain I will forgive you if you repent. Now, obviously, that does not include all the harm you've done to other people because they need to forgive you for the harm you do to others. But your sins between you and Allah, the things that you have done in private that people don't know about, the sins that do not include you dragging other people into them, those sins, Allah will forgive all of them if you repent before you die. And he will also forgive the oppression that you have done on those you have sought forgiveness from and you've made it up to them. You see, so when you oppress others, you actually have double the work to do. Because not only do you need to seek the forgiveness from Allah, but also the people whom you've harmed. So don't give up. If you're in that situation where you just feel like you've done so much bad and there's no way back, don't give up on your prayers. Because that's your lifeline. Your prayers are your lifeline to finding a way back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because if you cut from everything it's very hard to come back from that very hard to find you know the end of that thread 
to hold on to. But when you're still holding on to it, even if it's just with one finger, it's still something. All right. So always have that in mind. Don't let what people say put you off. Let people say whatever they want to say. Their qareen is working on you. Their qareen wants you to feel ashamed and ridiculous for even praying after you've done something that's not good. Like sometimes you see, you know, people complaining about men who come out from the club and then go and pray Fajr in the mosque. People laugh at these men like, are you serious? You've just come out from a club. And it's Fajr time and you want to go to the mosque and pray Fajr? It's a good thing that they do that. It's a good thing. They're still maintaining some connection to Allah. Whether they're hypocrites or not, whether they mean it or not, whether they're sincere in their prayers or not, that's got nothing to do with anybody. That's no one's business. But if you see someone praying while they're sinning, or if you're in that situation where you are praying while you're sinning and you feel ashamed, that shame is good. It means that your conscience is still working. It's still active. And you can find a way back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't stop your prayers when you are sinning. Hold on to them. Because wallah, it's hard to find that at the end of that thread when you completely cut loose from everything. Hold on to as much as you can and stop being the type of person who judges other people for praying while they sin. You will be judged for that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold you accountable for that. Because you're doing the work of Iblis by being that way with other people. Let people be. Leave them alone. Leave people alone to find their own journeys back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will guide whom he wills. And it's got nothing to do with anyone else. This is something between an individual and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he has guided you to Islam, that's love and mercy. If he's guided you back to faith after you losing it, that's his love and mercy. If he's sending you signs and hardships, that's his love and mercy. Don't let anyone tell you that this is because Allah doesn't love you. And I know it happens a lot in narc abuse. A narcissistic wife or husband, they'll laugh at you if they see you praying after you've done something bad. They'll say, oh, you think you're going to heaven? You think Allah's going to accept your repentance? I'm the husband. I'm your gatekeeper to paradise. And I will not forgive you for that. I will not allow Allah to let you into paradise. Who the hell are you to say that? A lot of narc abuse is spiritual abuse like that. People faith shame in narc abuse. They will laugh at you if you do things. I mean, I know a husband who laughed at his wife for wearing the hijab after 20 years of not wearing it. And he laughed and laughed and laughed at her. And he said, oh, you think Allah's going to forgive those last 20 years of you not wearing the hijab because you've put it on now? Who are you to say that? Who are you to say what Allah's going to forgive and what he's not going to forgive? Alhamdulillah, she's put it on. That's a sign of Allah's acceptance of her. That's a sign of Allah's love and mercy that she's doing the right thing. Again, even if it's in your 50s and 60s, it doesn't matter. As long as you do it before you die, alhamdulillah. Spiritual abuse and narcissistic relationships will do that. They will try to shame you for doing what's right because they have an envy towards your level of iman that they don't have. Always remember that. Narcissists will envy the level of iman that you have. So if you haven't prayed before and all of a sudden you want to start praying and, you know, while being married and your husband or wife mocks you like, oh, all of a sudden you're, you're turning into a pious sheikh now or a pious sheikh. You're starting to pray. Since when have you started praying? They mock you. They get jealous. Always remember it. Jealousy continue. Continue with it. Don't let them stop you. Don't let anyone stop you from practicing your faith and doing what you need to do. Because always remember that your qareen and the qareen of those who live with you and are in your environment will always try to stop you from doing that. Always. Always remember that. So no matter how much someone mocks you, ridicules you, belittles you, whatever, you know, they look down upon you, they shame you, continue with what you're doing. Exit that environment, exit that relationship if you can. But do not stop trying to establish a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never, ever, ever stop that. Because that is a massive part of satanic mission in narc abuse. To stop you praying and stop you doing what's right by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Always remember that. And you'll know this because the more you persevere in you know, establishing prayer, 
and wearing your hijab properly and doing this and doing that, the more angry they're going to get, the more irritated that person's going to get, that narcissist, because they don't want you to be better than them. They hate it. They hate seeing you improve. And this could be a friend, a parent, a sibling, a husband, a wife. They'll get jealous because they don't want to see that you're better than them in your deen, in your iman, and they will just try to bring you down by always reminding you of your sins. Oh, you wear the hijab now? Don't forget what you used to do. It doesn't all get wiped away. Never let these people get to you. Never let these people tell you that you're destined for hell. Never let them tell you that Allah doesn't love you. They do not have this knowledge. They do not have this knowledge. This is knowledge that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. As long as Allah is guiding you and there are signs that you are being guided and you are improving in your deen and improving in your iman, alhamdulillah, that's love and mercy from Allah. Love and mercy. And they don't like it. The Iblis in them doesn't like it. Because he wants Allah to hate all of his you know, human creation and see them as faulty and rebellious. So that flame of Iblis will light up within them and they just won't like it. They'll do whatever they can to stop you from practicing Islam in a better way and establishing a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a better way. They won't even like it when you get up for tahajjud. Again, they might laugh at you. They may do things to hinder your progress. That's what spiritual abuse is. Or at least it's a big part of it. And, you know, there are some husbands as well, um, narc Muslim husbands, who, when they see their wives are trying, you know, with their hijab, with their salah, they will try to make life more difficult. By saying, oh, okay, seeing as you want to become more religious, I'm going to forbid you from doing this, 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 this. And they pile all the requirements onto you so that you can do it properly. Right? Well, if you're going to wear the hijab, you're going to do it properly. I order you to wear a niqab. I order you to do this. I order you to do that. And now they make that task difficult for you. That rebuilding of iman you know, establishing salah, and now becomes a burden for you because now they make it difficult. They will add things to your routine or add things to, you know, to your relationship to make it hard. For example, they might say something like, oh, well, seeing as you're becoming so religious now, we're not going to celebrate birthdays anymore. No more anniversaries because it's haram. If you really want the haram and halal, well, we're not doing that anymore. We're not doing this anymore. We don't need to go on holidays anymore because that's not an Islamic requirement. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. That's what they'll do to you. Men especially. To make you hate your progress. To make you feel like it's been a burden. To make you feel like, oh my God, I've just made my life more difficult by trying to rebuild my iman. Always keep that in mind. This is what they do. This is what they do. Never damn forget it. When you see them do that, just persevere in what you're doing. And like I said, try and exit that situation as soon as possible if you have the ability to. Because these are people who are on a mission to completely crush, ruin and destroy your iman in any shape or form. In any way whatsoever. So if you're going through that type of spiritual abuse, it's going to be the hardest type of abuse you can go through. Because maintaining your iman through that kind of abuse can be difficult. But if you manage to do it, believe me when I tell you, you're a very powerful person. And you would have won against Iblis if you do not allow a narcissistic individual to destroy whatever iman you have. Whatever amount it is. If you do not allow someone to destroy your iman with their comments and with what they tell you about yourself and your efforts... And what you do or don't do, you're a powerful person. Just keep, just keep going. Continue with what you're doing and Allah will help you find a way out of it, inshallah. And he will find a way to help you protect the iman that you are growing. All right? So I just wanted to mention that because it's a problem I always hear about in my sessions with clients. And it's something that I've been through before as well in a previous experience. And this is why a lot of people... Um, I've made this podcast in general about faith issues in general. But it also mainly applies to people who have come out of narcissistic abuse. Because a lot of people who come out of that kind of abuse will suffer from faith issues. Because again, they will ask themselves, you know, why did you send me such a horrible person? Ya Allah, I've been a practicing person all my life. I've been away from zina. I've done this. I've done that. 
I still marry such a horrible person. Go back to my previous podcast about why Allah allowed you to marry a narcissist. I'm trying to link all of these podcasts together so that you can make logical sense of them as you go along. So I'm just trying to patch up the missing pieces to keep you going so that I can move on to the next topics, inshallah. So always remember that you have to protect yourselves. Don't even show people that you have Iman. I'm telling you, it's that bad. It's that bad. That people will even envy the amount of Iman that you have. The amount of spiritual strength that you have. Don't show people, even if you really truly are, don't show people that you are a highly pious person. That you are someone who has so much love for Allah and so much contentment in your life. Don't show it to people. Because they will envy you for that as well. Narcissists are never content with their life. Narcissists want you to be as miserable as they are. And they will give you hazard for even your iman. So if you've got a little bit of it, if you have a tiny little seed of it, you don't want them taking that away. Now, I'm not saying present yourselves as people who are not believers, of course. But just don't show people that you are happy with the amount of iman that you have. Because there will be people out there who will tear you down and make it look like that iman that you have is so insignificant. What's that going to do for you? That's not going to get you far. That's what's going to happen. But iman is a seed that grows. The more you water it, the more it grows. The more you allow yourself to look at the positive lessons in every hardship, the more it grows. And the more you are grateful for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, the more it grows. The more you remind yourself that everyone is on their own special, unique mission in life, everyone has their own unique purpose, the more it grows. Because you will be content and accept that just because other people have certain things in life doesn't mean that you'll have it because it doesn't align with your purpose. Okay? So those are three things that you can do to help your iman grow. Whether you've just come out of narc abuse or not, it's just something that will, inshallah, help those seeds of Iman to grow. And Allah will help you. Allah helps those who seek Iman. If you're seeking it, trust me, you'll find it. Inshallah, you will find it. And there's nothing wrong with finding it in your 50s and 60s. If you found it in your 20s, alhamdulillah. Say alhamdulillah for that ni'mah because that can be taken away from you if you put yourself on a high horse. If you believe you're better than everyone because you found Iman at a young age or because you were raised in a good way, in an advantageous way, that helps you have that Iman. Always say Alhamdulillah and be compassionate and empathic with other people. Everyone's still trying to figure it out. No one's going to be a perfect Muslim. And when I say, you know, finding Iman, I mean finding that true contentment in Allah's divine decree. Okay, it's the Iman that everything is okay, everything will be okay, Allah loves me no matter what, no matter what hardships come my way, I know Allah loves me, if good comes my way, alhamdulillah, if bad comes my way, alhamdulillah, what does Allah need me to learn from this, Allah sent it to me, because there is something that I need to benefit and learn from this, that's what iman is, it's that true tawakkul, true trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he knows what he's doing, and that he has not abandoned you, has not forgotten about you, and he does not hate you. That's Iman. That's Iman. Be grateful for what he's given you. That comes from Iman. Say so, Alhamdulillah for the blessings you have because it can always be worse. There are people who have less than you and they're content with it. You find that there are some people out there who are so poor. They've got nothing or very little. And they just find ways to be happy. There's this um, African group of children, they go viral on Instagram and they do dances. They're in Africa, they don't have what we have in the West or in the Middle East. They don't have those luxuries, but they are so happy, mashallah. They are such happy children and they just find, they make the most of what they have. That's Iman. So once you get out of that mindset of believing that Allah wants hardships for you, Allah wants your life to be difficult and that he doesn't love you once you break out of that mindset everything will get better in life everything gets better and all those voices of shayati and al and shayati and al-jinn will go away because always remember that's the mission of their qareen as well 
the mission of the Qareens, of women and men around you who say these things to you, it's, it's to keep you down. It's to keep you in a state of not finding Iman. And actually, they want you to lose the rest of what you have. What little you have, they want you to lose it. They want you to lose it by becoming atheist, by leaving Islam, by hating everything to do with religion. And a lot of people, unfortunately, do. So you may be a new Muslim listening to this and you're struggling, you know, with wearing the hijab, with fasting Ramadan, with quitting alcohol, you know, with, you know, with certain things. It's okay. It's totally fine. You're not actually expected to switch off all in one go and switch on everything good in one, all in one go. The Prophet Muhammad never taught the Sahaba that way. He taught them in stages. Things were, you know, stopped in stages and reformed in stages. If you feel like you're really struggling to do any of those things, it's okay. It doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you less of a Muslim. As long as you are trying. As long as you keep trying, you're fine. As long as you die trying, you'll be absolutely fine. It's when you don't try at all. And you just say, oh, Islam's in my heart. I don't have to do anything else. I don't need to pray. I don't need to cover. I don't need to do this. I don't need to do that. That's when it becomes a problem. But if you know what's right, if you know what you need to do and you're working on it, but it's a struggle and you're taking it a step at, you know, a, step at a time every day, you'll find your beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if you are not trying, Allah will help you. Allah will send you hardships to wake you up so that, you know, the same way Allah did with Fir'aun, he will keep sending you things and hardships and signs until you understand, I need to be more practicing. I need to pray my five a day it's not good enough that i pray whenever i remember and it's not good enough that i pray just once a day it's not good enough that i only fast some of ramadan and that i drink alcohol here and there i know it's wrong and i know i can stop it but i enjoy it it's not okay to do that you have to actually be actively trying to get better in your practicing of the deen and in the purification, maintaining the purification of your heart. And the purification of your heart means that you believe in a day of judgment that's coming and you treat people in accordance to that. You treat people and creatures, I'm including animals in this as well, and everything that Allah has created. You treat them on the basis that a day of judgment is coming and you'll be asked about all of it. This is how you maintain a qalb salim, that you'll be proud to present to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment because any of us can die at any moment or any day we don't know when that day is coming so we have to make sure that we at least die trying to attain a high level of iman that will elevate our nafs to the station of a nafs al mutma'inna and so we can be you know amongst the most beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's what we need to do it doesn't matter if you're not perfect. It doesn't matter if, you know, you die and you haven't perfected your deen. You haven't perfected the rituals and everything that you're meant to do. But if you die trying to do that every day, you make efforts to do that, then alhamdulillah, you're in a very good place. No one is expected to be perfect in their deen. I mean, I've seen in Jum'a prayer a lady give a lecture to a woman who was praying with nail polish on and she herself smelt really bad. She smelt of like loads of cooking, onions and all of that. She came to the masjid and she had the audacity to give her a lecture when actually the way she smelt being in that masjid was more of a problem than the woman praying with her nail polish on. Because sometimes, you know, bad smells when you're praying can distract you from, you know, focusing on your salah. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad said, you know, do not come to the masjid smelling badly. What's more important, that you come to the masjid smelling really good? Or someone come into the masjid with no polish on and you're giving her a lecture about her prayers not being accepted when you yourself are distracting everyone from their salah. Her nails are not distracting anybody. You're just finding something to pick on. People like that I never listen to. People like that I just, their words I just brush off. 
because they don't see themselves or they do see themselves but they just want to pick on other people they want to nitpick on everything that you you know you do or don't do oh your hijab's not on properly oh why have you got nail polish on oh you know why are you doing this and why are you doing that if you know that you're someone who tries don't allow the comments of people to bring you down because they don't know the hardships that you're going through and even if they know the hardships that you're going through, it's none of their business. It's none of their business. Unless you are committing a major sin in public, in front of everybody, the little flaws that you have are nobody's business. Yes, we have the Islamic obligation, the social obligation of reminding people and helping people to be better and everything. But it becomes an irritation when it comes from people who believe that they are better than everyone else and they're on a high horse and they'll come and lecture you about something and it's like, hmm, you know, have you looked at yourself? Have you perfected all your faults and all your flaws? More often than not, that's not the case. People just love to pick on other people. So don't take it to heart. Improve what you can as long as you are not committing major sins in public and justifying them or being careless about them, then, you know, People shouldn't be on your case about the little things that you struggle with. Right? Everyone's got their struggles. Everyone has their struggles with certain things in life. And they're different for everybody. So just be aware of that. Don't let it get you down. And inshallah, this podcast will help you to you know, navigate your, your way out of these spiritual difficulties please go back and listen to my previous podcasts about you know the human body why Allah sent a narcissist into your life if you're struggling with that about the new supply you know I try my best in my podcast to insert the wisdoms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending you these people or sending you these hardships so that you can make sense of them so you can come out of the mindset of being hated by Allah or not being loved by Allah or not being worthy in the eyes of Allah Okay, a lot of people say that they're not worthy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love, which is not true. Everyone is worthy of it. If Fir'aun was worthy of it, if Fir'aun was worthy of more chances until the ocean was split, then, you know, who are we to say that we're not worthy of Allah's love and Allah's chances and Allah's guidance and mercy if Fir'aun was given it? Okay, so try not to be so hard on yourself. Always remember that Allah's love is there for everybody until our last day. And just work, just work on that. Just work really hard on seeing the positives, inshallah, in every situation. So I've given you a few tips and things to do to help with that, inshallah, in this podcast. And please do send this podcast to anyone who could benefit from it inshallah i'm sure you know loads of people who could benefit from this information please do share it you'll get the rewards for helping people who really need to hear this okay because this is a huge struggle of most people in our ummah and do like it you know if you um if you found it helpful and do comment below if i've missed anything or if i haven't addressed something properly do drop it below and i will try and include it in another podcast inshallah Thank you so much for all your kind comments. I read everything that gets posted in YouTube under all the podcasts. I really appreciate everyone's du'as for me and your kind feedback. I love to know that the podcasts have helped you and that they've resonated with you. And if you haven't already, do grab a copy of the book, The Muslim Narcissist. All the foundational information is in there. So these podcasts are a supplement to the book. And if you need one-to-one counselling and coaching, I do offer that service. Just drop me an email, author at themuslimnarcissist.com and just give me a brief of your case and I'll get back to you, inshallah, with a short form to fill out. So if you are struggling with being tested by your hardship and you are unable to find the hidden gems from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can talk about it and I can help you find them. I can help you find all the, the lessons and the valuable wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may be trying to give you so that you can improve your life and move on with your life as well and grow your iman and always remember the prophets were all tested all the sahaba were tested you know we're all just human beings at the end of the day we all go through our tests and trials and hardships so you know 
sometimes we just need the extra help from other people to help us find the positives and the hidden gems in our situations that we find to be unbearable or very difficult. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, that's what communities are meant for. That's what friends are meant for. And that's what, you know, supportive family is meant for. So if you don't have the support, do reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to help you, inshallah, um, figure all of that out. So thank you for listening until now, if you're still with me. May Allah bless you. And until the next podcast, inshallah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.